All right, so maybe we'll go ahead and get started. It gives me great pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Bruce Albiagli. Bruce um, went to medical school in Lagos, Nigeria, spent um, about a decade there afterwards before he moved to the United States. And he uh, landed in LA, where he got a master's in clinical science at UCLA, then went and did a neurology residency at UC Irvine, followed by a vascular neurology fellowship at UCLA, where he rose through the ranks and the faculty there. And, and really made a name for himself in, in the stroke world doing research that I think focuses on how do you take the science of, of what we know about stroke, stroke prevention, stroke outcome, and translate that into clinical practice. And he developed something called the um, PROTECT um, program, which was really kind of making sure that people adhered to those things that we know work with secondary prevention and preventing hospital complications. And um, has, has really been very, um, prolific in his, his um, publications. Um, he then left UCLA, went to UCSD for maybe not quite a year, um, and now is chair um, of neurology at the Medical University of South Carolina. He continues to do um, a lot of research um, and, and, and publish in this idea of, of translating what we know about stroke um, into the clinical practice. And has been telling us about some of the programs he's working in in Africa right now. He's got um, projects in um, Nigeria as well as in Ghana um, and looking at the stroke risk factors as well as secondary stroke prevention specifically around um, hypertension treatment. Today I think we're going to hear something different than that um, but Bruce is always such an elegant speaker and we're very happy to have him here. Thanks a lot Bruce. And I should say one of the best things about Bruce is February 18th I get to hand the baton for the International Stroke Conference to Bruce and it is no longer my problem after that so thank you for that Bruce. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Kira, for that very kind introduction. And uh, before you hand it over to me, I still have a lot to learn from you. So, so thank you. Thank you. So, good afternoon. Thanks so much for having me here. It's a privilege and a pleasure to talk to you about uh, chronic kidney disease. Um, so, over the course of the next forty-five minutes or thereabouts, we'll be talking about the relationship between chronic kidney disease and stroke. Uh, we'll start off by asking ourselves why we're even looking at this to begin with. Uh, we'll talk about some of the indices of chronic kidney disease and how they relate to stroke. We'll talk about biomarkers of kidney disease and how they relate to subclinical brain injury. Why subclinical brain injury? Well, it's thought that if there is indeed a relationship between the kidney and the brain, that it's probably small vessel disease. That's the common um, um, entity that connects both of them. So we'll take a look at subclinical brain injury, take a look at some of the mechanisms at play, and then we'll take a look at what the effect of having CKD is on outcomes after you experience a stroke. Um, and then conclusions. I, I got an interest in this a few years ago when I would be on the stroke consult service and each time they'll do um, just an incidental MRI because uh, a CKD patient um, is altered or uh, in some way and they would find that the patient had microbes. This happened so often that I developed an interest in this and that's where this, this actually came from, came from for me. So, so the first thing, why look at this? Well, the reason why is that even though we have lots of traditional risk factors for stroke that have been identified, we still know that there are lots of people who experience a stroke for whom don't have traditional risk factors. So these data that were published in JAMA a little while ago looked at about half a million subjects in various cardiovascular and stroke studies and found that while many of them had those traditional risk factors of hypertension, diabetes, and smoking, up to 20% of these patients did not have any of those conventional risk factors. So yet they had these um, vascular events, but did not have the traditional risk factors they were all well familiar with. So the issue is what increased, the, what led them to have those events that they had, and can we identify other risk factors beyond those conventional ones that we know? And so this is a list of the many of the conventional uh, risk factors and many of the emerging or uh, novel risk factors. So uh, in terms of stroke, People are looking at relationship between sleep habits and stroke risk, psychosocial factors like depression and stress and stroke risk, environmental factors like pollution and particulate matter. People are looking at various inflammatory indices and stroke risk, metabolic syndrome, and of course what we're going to talk about today, 
chronic kidney disease. Now these are data from the REACH registry. The REACH registry is an international registry that collects data of patients who have atherosclerosis. So whether it's stroke, whether it's MI, whether it's peripheral arterial disease. And as of the time when these data were published, there were almost 20,000 uh, uh, patients of whom um, data had been collected on regard to stroke. What they found was that almost half of that stroke population had disease in more than one vascular bed. So beyond the cerebrovascular bed, which of course they had a stroke, but they had a disease in at least one other bed, whether it was the perifer peripheral arterial bed or whether it was the coronary vascular bed. So about a third of them had disease in two disease locations, and almost 6% of them had disease in three disease locations. But the question was, or the question is, what about the renal vascular bed? We don't tend to look at that as often as potentially we should. And so this was, um, these um, quotes, so to speak, that you see on the last three bullets came from a special edition of The Lancet that was published five years ago, dedicated the, to the relationship between kidney disease and cardiovascular disease. So what do we know? So we know that most CKD patients don't die from progression of their CKD, rather they die from a cardiovascular cause including stroke. So most of the time they die from cardiovascular causes. But what this, the, many of the editorials in this Lancet issue seem to point to was because the kidney is somewhat silent, somewhat asymptomatic, so to speak, many of us tend to overlook its importance. And potentially, lots of opportunities are being lost in terms of discriminating patients who have CKD and potentially treating them such that they might not go ahead and die from cardiovascular causes, which really is the number one cause of death in these patients. Even before that special edition of the Lancet came out, the American Heart Association, American Stroke Association, issued an advisory almost 10 years ago, again recognizing this potential relationship between CKD and, um, and vascular risk. And so they recommended that if you do see a patient with vascular disease, evaluate them for presence of CKD. And if indeed they do have presence of CKD, repeat the test again in three months and treat them accordingly. If they don't have CKD, then repeat that test every year. So this advice came out 10 years ago. Most providers that I know don't routinely do this. And so when you do see that stroke patient, do you specifically take note as to whether they have CKD? Do you make sure that they're tested again three months after you see them? And if you indeed you see them on a yearly basis, do you make sure that that test is repeated annually? So anecdotally, I know that many of my, I, I wasn't doing this before, and many of my colleagues don't necessarily do this. So let's talk about CKD itself. Again, this might be very basic for some of you, I apologize, but this is just an overview, just to give you a little bit of background to the issue of CKD and its definition and types. And so essentially, of course, it represents a structural or functional abnormality in the kidneys. Has to be present for three months to get the definition of being a chronic issue, and generally manifests as either albuminuria, I'm sorry, albuminuria, or low glomerular filtration rate. A few things to talk about when it comes to albuminuria and low GFR. So of course, it's, it's increased permeability of the albumin in the glomerulus. You have macro albuminuria and you have micro albuminuria. It's very clear that macro albuminuria is related to uh, cardiovascular disease. What has become of much more interest to many people is that even micro albuminuria, that's um, where you have this increased urine albumin excretion that is above normal limits, but still can be detected by a regular urine dipstick, that is also related to um, uh, risk, and we'll see some of that later when we discuss it. But when you look at the methods for testing microalbuminuria, the best method, the easiest method, the least cumbersome method is to do a spot urine test looking at urine albumin creatinine ratio. So that's what we tend to do when we're trying to assess microalbuminuria. For GFR, the most common way of assessing this is the MDR equation. There's a more recent equation that was introduced about five years ago called the CKD epi equation. It's supposed to be more accurate than, than this MDRD equation because it actually is better for discriminating CKD in elderly patients. But why it's so, it's so wonderful to use is that it requires just demographic data and your serum creatinine level. And so many times, I'm sure when you order reports, even on your basic metabolic panel, it spits out what the person's uh, GFR rate is. So many times you have that information at your disposal. What do you do with it? 
So more recently, Hot of the Press, this was published in one of the Lancet subspecialty journals just a couple of days ago, was a meta-analysis of over 600,000 patients. This was a meta-analysis at the individual level, so it actually analyzes at the individual level. What's the upshot of this particular study? Well, it showed that low GFR and microalbuminuria actually improved discrimination of cardiovascular risk beyond just traditional risk factors. So they added value in terms of pointing out those people at very high risk for cardiovascular disease in the general populations. And when you actually combine them, not looking at them individually, combine them together, they actually outperformed any of our single traditional predictors, whether it was hypertension, whether it was cholesterol, whether it was diabetes. And so, again, lots of data point to the fact that these two biomarkers, either individually or collectively, could really help us to discriminate risk in patients at high risk for having vascular events, including stroke. So we'll take a look at those biomarkers and what their relationship is to stroke specifically. So we did this study a few years ago. It was a meta-analysis of all the stroke studies looking at the relationship between GFR and incident stroke risk. And by incident stroke risk, I mean a first-time stroke. So these are this is a general population. They've never experienced a cardiovascular event before. And it's looking at the relationship between baseline GFR level and the relationship of having a first-time stroke. And as you can see here, when you looked at a GFR of 60 to 90, and its relationship, and having that at baseline and having an incident stroke, it really didn't confer um, additional risk. So um, a negligible, a null value of uh, three, three, um, uh, of 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 of, of uh, three percent, and so really not a, a, a doesn't confer a significant uh, uh, risk of experiencing a stroke if you have a baseline GFR value between sixty to ninety. Having said that, if your GFR drops below 60, then it's a little bit of a different story. And you see here you have an 18% higher risk of experiencing a first-time stroke, and this is significant, if indeed your GFR is lower than 60. So above 60, 60 to 90, no, but lower than 60, you definitely at higher risk for experiencing a first-time stroke. And see, so this looked at a whole host of prospective cohort studies um, to come up with this quantitative and qualitative estimate. More information about that particular meta-analysis. The relationship between low GFR and incident stroke was consistent across the different populations. The lower the GFR, so we said below 60, then you have increased risk of stroke. But when you went to, when you looked at GFR between 40 to 60, then it was 28% higher risk. When it was, um, when you looked at GFR less than 40, then it was 77% higher risk of experiencing stroke. So there seemed to be this dose-dependent response. The lower the GFR, the much more likely a person was to experience a stroke, first-time stroke. And very interestingly, um, there seemed to be this difference by race in terms of Asian individuals especially seem to have this very strong relationship between low GFR and having a higher risk of future stroke. As you can see, almost twice, almost double the risk of having a stroke if they had a low GFR. There's another entity that's in, uh, beginning to um, uh, gain attention, and that's the entity called serum cystatin C. It's, um, it's a peptide of lo low molecular weight. Um, it, when, the, um, when there's declining kidney function, then cystatin levels begin to rise. And it's been shown to be a much more precise test of kidney function than looking at serum creatinine levels. And so people are beginning to use that. It's not pervasive, but um, it's increasingly being used because it's, it's supposed to be more precise than looking at creatinine levels. Having said that, our group looked at this as well, looked at the creatinine, looked at the serum cystatin studies out there that have looked at the relationship between it and stroke and found again that if you had a higher serum cystatin level, you're much more likely to experience a, a primary stroke as well. So whether you looked at the creatinine-based GFR level or you looked at the serum cystatin-based um, GFR level, it was the same thing. You have a higher risk of experiencing a stroke um, if your kidney is in decline. So we spoke about one biomarker, GFR. What about the other one, albuminuria, or urine albumin excretion? So we also looked at this as well, again, pulling all the data that's out there to come up with a qualitative and quantitative estimate of the relationship between microalbuminuria at baseline and having a first-time stroke. Um, here, the risk of having a first-time stroke is 33% higher if you do have microalbuminuria at baseline. 
And when you looked at it and you broke it down into micro and macro, not surprisingly, if you had macro, you were 54% higher. If you were, uh, had micro, it was 22% higher. But overall, whether you had micro or macro, you had much higher risk if you have um, albuminuria baseline in terms of having a future first-time stroke. So both albuminuria, whether it's micro or macro, and low GFR, whether it's creatinine-based or cystatin C-based, all seem to portend higher risk of stroke, especially first-time stroke. But which CKD index is better, GFR or albuminuria? We don't know for sure. In uh, many of the studies that have been done across the cardiovascular literature, it seems as if albuminuria is a stronger predictor of, of cardiovascular events than um, GF, low GFR. There's been only one study um, in the literature, as far as I know, that has looked at both of these in the same study. And this was uh, based on CHS data. They looked at the relationship between um, GFR, elevated cystatin C, and albuminuria, and a first-time stroke in these patients who were um, elderly. And what they found was that the strongest predictor of having a stroke was microalbuminuria. Um, and it was uh, especially a very strong relationship with hemorrhagic stroke. Um, it had it with any stroke, but uh, very strong with hemorrhagic stroke. Um, you can see the confidence intervals are very, very, very wide, but it, that was where the strongest relationship was. But it had a relationship with any type of stroke. And even if you adjusted for GFR, that relationship still held as well. So at least based on this study, it does seem like as if albuminuria is, slight, is, is, is a stronger predictor of incident stroke than maybe uh, low GFR might be. And what about recurrent stroke risk? So we've talk, spoken about initial stroke risk, low GFR, um, primary stroke risk, um, albuminuria, primary stroke risk. What about secondary stroke risk? The kind of patients that you see all the time, patients who've actually had a stroke. Does knowing what their GFR tell you anything about their risk of a recurrent stroke? Well, it turns out it does. We analyzed the professed database and we looked at the outcome of stroke alone and stroke myovascular death. Remember, these were patients who had all experienced a recent ischemic stroke, 20,000 um, patients in this uh, data set. What we found was that after adjusting for risk factors, if you had your GFR was lower than 60, uh, you had CKD, you had a much higher risk of experiencing um, a recurrent stroke, and you're much more likely um, of experiencing a recurrent vascular event, either a stroke and MR vascular death, if at the time of your stroke your, uh, you had a low GFR. So both primary and recurrent stroke are related to indices of CKD. So what might be the potential pathophysiologic mechanism at play? And so this is a little bit of a long section because we don't know. So I'll, 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 I'll take you through what we, we think we know as we go by. As I mentioned, we think that the relationship between the brain, at least in terms of vascular brain injury, and the kidneys is probably due to cerebral small vessel disease. And of course, I'm speaking to neurologists, so all of you are familiar with the three main types of cerebral, uh, cerebral small vessel disease. Lacuna infarctions, of course, due to um, uh, occlusion of those small penetrating arteries due to either microartho or lipohyalinosis. We know, we know those lacunes when we see them. Well, of course, we all know about leukoariosis as well. And we all know about cerebral microbes as well. But these are the, the three main distinct entities of cerebral small vessel disease. And so the issue has been, well, most of the studies that have looked at the relationship between kidney disease and, um, and stroke have focused on cerebral small vessel disease it's because that's where we think that is the common or unifying uh, uh, connection between both of these organs. And so this is a very, very busy slide. So I'll just take you through um, what the high points are here. So this was trying to discriminate between is the relationship one of an epiphenomenon, meaning that if something's happening in the kidneys, it's probably also happening in the brain, or is something happening in the kidney and causing something to happen in the brain? So does one come before the other, or are they one and the same thing? So these are uh, uh, five uh, prospective studies. Uh, Dr. Longstreth, of course, um, has, has one of these that were uh, uh, in this particular uh, analysis. And what you see here is that there seems to be a bidirectional relationship. What do I mean by that? It seems as if if you have CKD at baseline, if you follow that patient or those patients for a while, they are more likely to develop lacunae infarcts. We also see the same thing. If you have lacunae infarcts at baseline, if you follow that patient for a while, they're more likely to have a decline in their 
renal function. So as you can see here in Dr. Longshore's study, at baseline, people of high serum creatinine were much more likely to develop future lacuna in facts. In this particular study, if you had decreased GFR um, at follow-up, it was found in the decreased GFR of fault was found in patients who had lacuna infarcts at baseline. So then again, you go back to the other direction again, low GFR at baseline, higher white matter lesion progression, um, and so forth. And so you see that it seems to be bidirectional, meaning pretty much suggesting that this might be an epiphenomenon, that it's not necessarily that kidney disease causes vascular brain injury, but it might be one and the same process. That it just seems to start in one organ and then subsequently progress to another organ. That's what these um, uh, uh, data suggest to us. Um, and so, but we'll talk about that a little bit more. And so the issue is this, is CKD a risk marker of stroke? We've seen that it's a risk, it, it portends risk of stroke. We've seen that if you have low GFR at baseline, or you have albumin at baseline, you're much more likely to have a primary stroke or secondary stroke. But the issue is, is it a risk marker or a causal risk factor? If you have CKD at baseline and you address it, could you improve a person's outcome such that they don't have future vascular brain injury, don't have future strokes? And so what goes towards the argument of it being a risk marker? Well, they have very common risk factors, right? So diabetes, hypertension, dyslipidemia, very common. So they probably occur together. So it's probably an epi epiphenomenon. Then you talk about the strain hypothesis. These are both organs in which they are there's high pressure into these very small vessels and they strill to contain them because of this vasodilation upstream. Then there's also the nitric oxide hypothesis, which also seems to um, pertain to both of them as well. So there are several potential pathophysiologic <coughs> mechanisms that seem to affect both organs that make you feel as if this is just one and the same thing happening to, diff to different organs, but it's just one process. This is not causal. The other thing is that the pathology is very, is very much the same. You have leaking proteins, whether you have leaking proteins such that they leak into the urine, or whether you have leaking proteins where they leak into the brain extracellular space, it looks very much the same in terms of pathology. So again, it suggests that perhaps this might be an epiphenomenon, two things happening in different organs, uh, uh, one thing happening in different organs, potentially at different times or at the same time, but it's just one process affecting both. There's also the issue of genetic predisposition. There are certain genetic syndromes that contain many of these entities that we're aware of. So um, uh, you have the Hearn syndrome, of course, which has people have cerebral white matter lesions. They have renal dysfunction, which includes albuminuria and low GFR um, as well. You have this CO14AI uh, mutation as well, where you have leukoencephalopathy, you have microbleeds, you have microalbuminuria. So again, a suggestion that maybe there's also a genetic basis for this, um, for this um, uh, injury to both the kidneys and to the brain. So all of these, all of these um, uh, uh, descriptions seem to suggest that perhaps this is just one epiphenomenon, one process that is affecting both the brain and both the kidneys, and probably not causal. Probably suggesting that the best what we could do is if we see a patient has CKD, be very aggressive in teaching those patients because they are high risk for stroke, but don't expect that necessarily you might do anything to um, specifically to try and prevent them from having another stroke. Now, what argues in favor of a causal relationship? Well, almost every time we see a study that looks at the relationship between CKD and stroke, there's a dose-dependent response, meaning that the worse your CKD, almost much more likely you are to have a stroke. Now, of course, that doesn't mean causality, but you could infer causality from that. Uh, and so many of the studies that we have looked at and many of the studies in the literature should just show that when you look at grade of CKD, the much more likely a person is to have more incre uh, increased severity of white matter lesions, increased severity of lacuna infarcts, increased risk of experiencing a stroke. So there is that strong exposure response relationship, which from which one might infer, might infer that there might be a causal relationship. Um, we also saw that in the PROFESS study I spoke about, these are patients who experienced a recent ischemic stroke, and we looked at uh, uh, the impact of low GFR on future uh, recurrent vascular events. The more severe your chronic disease was, the more likely you were to have experienced an ischemic stroke. So if you were in CKD stage 1, the milder stage, 7.7% risk. If you were in 4 and 5, 14% risk, and you see it rises with time. Same thing for vascular events as well. So again, this exposure response relationship from which we might infer 
perhaps that there might be some kind of causal uh, relationship. We also looked at mortality after a stroke. Similar pattern yet again. The more severe your CKD was, the much more likely you were to die um, from all causes after you experienced a stroke. Going from 2.74 to 3.37 to 8.19. So this is what the hypothesis is if indeed there is a causal relationship between the kidneys and vascular brain injury. It's thought that there's initial damage to the kidneys and that activates the renin angiosensin system. That in turn then stimulates NADPH oxidase and then this upregulation of lots of inflammatory mediators. And of course there's also scavenging of nitric oxide. So all of that then leads to this very diffuse or generalized systemic dysfunction which also affects the cerebrovascular bed. So it's all thought to start from the kidneys with that initial damage to the ren renal endothelium and then stimulation of the um, renin angiotensin system. And then you have this release of all these uh, uh, deleterious um, inflammatory mediators which end up affecting the cerebrovascular bed. So that's the theory of, that's the uh, hypothesis for a potential causal relationship. The other thing that is also being thought about is if indeed there's a causal relationship, how do we address it? And so one question is, could there be a role for renin angiotensin system modulators? So things like ACE inhibitors, things like angiotensin receptor blockers. And so two things seem to support there being a potential role for at least renin angiotensin system blockers. Number one is that we know we, we know that renin angiotensin system modulators protect the kidneys. So we know that if somebody has uh, albuminuria, the nephrologists tend to put them on a renin angiotensin modulator to try and decrease the progression of that albuminuria. Could we potentially have the same thing in the brain? If potentially somebody has is at risk, potentially has vascular brain injury, lacuna infarcts, or leukoencephalopathy, um, could we potentially put them on a renin angiotensin modulator and prevent the progression of that disease? So that's one. So it works in the kidneys. Could that potentially work in the brain as well? The other thing, as I mentioned, is this strain hypothesis, this hyperfusion pressure. We know selective agents are very good at reducing this um, central, uh, cerebral pulse pressure, calcium channel blockers, and renin angiotensin system modulators. Again, could we potentially have these targeted agents um, aimed at trying to improve outcomes in patients who we know um, already have kidney disease? So that's the question, whether especially for RAS modulators, could they have a role, whether it's from what we've seen them do in terms of preventing progression of kidney disease or what they could do in terms of reducing cerebral pulse pressure. So we try to look at that in that same PROFESS database of 20,000 patients who had experienced a recent ischemic stroke. In that particular study, patients were also randomized to telmasartan, an angiotensin receptor blocker, and placebo, and were followed, of course, to see um, the effect on uh, recurrent vascular events. What we did was to tease out those patients who had low GFR. So cohort of patients who had low GFR and experienced a recent ischemic stroke. And we took a look to see if those who received adon telmasartin versus placebo and had low GFR and had a rec recent ischemic stroke, whether they actually benefited. It turns out they didn't. And so as you can see here, when you adjust, it's 1.08 here, 0.99. Uh, confidence intervals of course are not significant at all. So no advantage in terms of this angiotensin receptor blocker um, in these patients who have experienced a recent ischemic stroke and had low GFR. Now we think there was no effect because we think in this professed study they took in large vessel patients, small vessel patients. We think you have to actually look at a specific subtype, especially small vessel disease subtype, if you're going to have an effect of um, an agent like this. The other thing, of course, is maybe the agent itself wasn't strong enough, maybe the dose wasn't potent enough, but suffice enough to say in this observational study, we didn't see any um, benefit of an ARB in these patients who had low GFR and experienced a stroke. What was more promising was when we did an analysis of a database of patients who had experienced ICH and also had microbeads. We looked to see if those who had were on a RAS modulator, a renal angiotensin system modulator, were less or more likely to have um, microbleeds if they had CKD. And what we found was a strong trend, such that patients who had CKD and were on a RAS modulator were less likely, less likely uh, to have cerebral microbleeds than patients who had CKD and were not on a RAS modulator. 
So that was a strong trend and it's something where uh, we want to investigate further to see if perhaps there might be an effect um, of this uh, rust not latent in terms of microbes. And so I'll just talk about a study that we are developing and it's looking at this particular agent, it's called Aliscrin, it's also known as Tech Turner. And it's a direct renin inhibitor, so it's a separate class from ACE inhibitors and angiotensin receptor blockers. And um, it, uh, it's, 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 it disrupts the renin angiotensin system, of course, at a much earlier stage. And so is used many times as add-on therapy on top of ACE inhibitors or angiotensin receptor blockers. Um, as proof of concept, um, this paper was published in the New England Journals some years ago, looking at patients who had um, albuminuria, randomized them to alistrin, this agent, versus placebo. All the patients received an angiotensin receptor blocker. So the, um, the alistrin was just add-on therapy, but everybody was on a, uh, 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 an angiotensin receptor blocker. These are patients who had diabetes and um, also had albuminuria. As you can see, there was no difference in terms of blood pressure, whether you looked at systolic blood pressure or diastolic blood pressure. Remember, everybody got the same agent, but the only difference was that one group got this um, aliscrin, the other group got placebo. But yet, even though you know, there was a difference in terms of this add-on therapy, there was no difference in terms of blood pressure. But there was a difference in terms of progression in terms of microalbuminuria, a 20% difference. So no difference in blood pressure, but a difference in terms of progression of microalbuminuria. So this presumably might have been due to a different effect, not a blood pressure effect. Remember, there was no difference in blood pressure, but there was a difference, an advantage for those patients who had the aliscrin on top of the ARB, as opposed to those patients who just have placebo um, on top of the ARB. So the additional 20% reduction in the progression of albuminuria. Could we see the same thing with stroke patients in terms of vascular brain injury? So would add-on aliscrin potentially reduce progression of vascular brain injury in patients who are on, who, who are, have some evidence of CKD and are more likely to progress with CKD and maybe even vascular brain injury. And so we are designing this study, it's called Mr. Hemostat, and it's looking at randomizing patients who have cerebral microbes at baseline to aliscrin versus placebo. Um, and to see what the effect in terms of formation of new microbes one year after uh, randomization would be. So the expectation is that by being randomized to aliscrin, there will be a reduction in the formation of new microbes. All of these patients at baseline would have some form of compromised kidney function, whether it's in terms of albuminuria or low GFR, but they and they also have to have microbes, and then we'll randomize them to aliscrin versus placebo and see if there's an effect in these patients. What we're hoping, or the theory, is that these are patients who um, already have initial renal and endothelial damage, probably have some activation of the renin angiotensis system like we saw. By putting them on a list screen, we potentially can curb that a little bit and potentially uh, reduce the, the upregulation of all those inflammatory uh, uh, markers that you saw that might cause uh, uh, more microbes from forming. So we're in discussions with Novartis who makes this medication and we'll see, we'll see how that goes. But uh, it will be the first time that anybody's looked at this in this, in this type of way. And then finally, the last section will look at um, the relationship between CKD and post-stroke outcomes. So um, what's the relationship between CKD and outcome for that stroke patient that you see in the hospital? So one of the challenges with CKD has always been, well, on one hand, we know that chronic kidney disease is associated with thrombus formation. CKD patients are at high risk for having ischemic events. Very, very clear, especially when the CKD stage is three to five. So due to all these many things, we know that they are high risk for having thrombus formation. And so that's why, of course, many of these patients, we want to put them on um, antithrombotics to try and uh, address the issue of their increased risk for thrombus formation. On the other hand, we also know that CKD is associated with higher bleeding risk. And so because of all these factors as well. And so that's why there's also a little bit of reluctance in many situations as to how aggressive are you with the antithrombotic agent in patients who have CKD? At what stage do you try and balance the issue of ischemia versus the issue of bleeding risk? And so that is also another issue that um, uh, has to be addressed in these patients. So first of all, what we wanted to do was to analyze the Get With The Guidelines database. Get With Guidelines database is a quality improvement registry. Um, they collect data on patients who are hospitalized for stroke around the country. 
And so we interrogated the database to get some answers as to what are the outcomes for stroke patients who are hospitalized and have evidence of CKD, in this case as defined by low GFR. And so we looked at ischemic stroke and hemorrhagic stroke. We looked to see what the issue was in terms of what their outcomes were and what the processes in terms of their care was. So on this very first slide, we looked at care performance. How well was care delivered to patients who were hospitalized with an ischemic stroke if they had CKD versus if they did not have CKD? And we looked at all these very important benchmarks for, um, of quality stroke care in the hospital. And as you can see, when you compare CKD patients versus not, not uh, patients who don't have CKD, almost across the board, CKD patients were much less likely to receive these um, uh, parameters of quality stroke care than patients who had CKD. Now, remember, of course, we had almost 700,000 patients here. So when you see significance, it's because we have huge numbers. But still, at the same time, you see a 14 they were 14% less likely to receive smoking cessation counseling discharge. 18% uh, less likely to receive an antithrombotic within 48 hours. So still, you see this disparity in care for patients who have chronic kidney disease. Now, because we were looking at the registry, it's hard for us to see exactly what was going on. Why were these CKD patients, for reasons that were not clear to us, and without any clear contraindications, receiving all these um, uh, uh, parameters of quality stroke care at a less frequent rate than people that did not have CKD? And yet, they were receiving at a less frequent rate, but their outcomes were worse. So if you look at in-hospital mortality, and you look at GFR less than 60, for these recent ischemic stroke patients hospitalized, and if they had CKD, they were 44% higher odds of dying in the hospital compared to patients who did not have CKD. And if, again, you see that dose-dependent response, mild dysfunction, 0.99, but as you go, as the CKD gets worse, much more likely to die in the hospital. So poorer outcomes, but also poorer care. Are they related? Is that a, is that a causal relationship between the two? Not clear, but um, poorer outcomes and poorer, uh, poorer processes and poorer outcomes. We also looked at hemorrhagic stroke patients. Um, the uh, parameters of quality care are a little bit different. We just looked at two. We looked at DVT prophylaxis in these patients, and we looked at smoking cessation counseling in these patients. And there was no difference in terms of smoking cessation counseling. It was right, right at one. But um, these patients who uh, had CKD and experienced a stroke were 12% less likely to have DVT prophylaxis than patients who did not have CKD. Again, not clear why that was. And DVT prophylaxis was not just giving subcute heparin. It was also, you could also be having TED stockings as well. But for whatever reason, these patients were not getting that um, uh, at the same rate as people who did not have CKD. And yet, again, the outcomes were worse. CKD patients who had a hemorrhagic stroke who had a 47% higher likelihood of dying in the hospital compared to those who did not have CKD. And again, you see that same dose dependent response from 1.12 to 2.22 if somebody was in renal, renal failure. So again, not so great processes and not so great outcomes. What about patients who are treated with IV TPA? We looked just at their outcomes, and again, similar pattern that we saw with ischemic stroke patients overall and um, hemorrhagic stroke patients. We saw that having CKD portended poorer um, outcomes, more likely to die in the hospital. Again, a dose-dependent response, as you can see here. One of the things that was very important to us to tease out in the TPA-treated patients was the issue that I alluded to at the early part of this section. CKD is associated with ischemia, but it's also associated with hemorrhage. And while it's not a, 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 an established contraindication to giving TPA, we just wondered, as we saw from the processes, that they were less likely to get TPA. Were practitioners or providers less likely to give these patients TPA because they were worried about the dreaded complication of symptomatic ICH or systemic um, hemorrhage, so, uh, uh, which is another matter? Well, we took a look to see if potentially for patients who had CKD who received TPA, whether there were any higher risk of having a symptomatic ICH. There's probably never going to be a clinical trial looking at this. So arguably, this might be the best data that we have looking at this question because probably not going to be a clinical trial looking at it. But in these 
almost 45,000 IVTPA treated ischemic stroke patients. When you looked at presence of CKD versus not, there was no difference. No difference in terms of there was no higher risk of experiencing a symptomatic intracerebral hemorrhage after TPA uh, for treatment of ischemic stroke if you had CKD. So essentially no reason to exclude a patient who is otherwise eligible for IVTPA on the basis of them having CKD. And again, if you look at um, the various stages, you actually do not see that any one stage seems to portend higher risk. Even for those people in renal failure, if anything, it went in the other direction. Um, but definitely no higher risk of a symptomatic ICH um, on the basis of having CKD, even when you have severe CKD. And then we looked at severe systemic hemorrhage as well. Could somebody who receives TPA and has CKD be at higher risk for having systemic hemorrhages? Because again, because of that associated higher risk of hemorrhage in patients who have CKD. We did not see that either. So if you had CKD defined as GFR lower than 60, no higher risk. And we looked at all the different categories again, there was no higher risk of experiencing um, a severe systematic, uh, systemic hemorrhage. So, to conclude, um, definitely an independent link between CKD and stroke. So whether you look at primary stroke risk or you look at secondary stroke risk, if you have CKD at baseline, you have much higher risk of having, having either one of those. One challenge is that it's not clear whether CKD is necessarily a risk marker or it's a causal risk factor. If it's a risk marker, what does that do for you? Well, it helps you to educate your patient. Maybe you might be a little more aggressive with blood pressure control and uh, treating cholesterol, but it helps you to give information to the patient and maybe you'll be a little bit more aggressive. Now, if it's a causal risk factor, that's another thing, and that we need to investigate a little bit better. We need to better understand the nature of the relationship and potentially see if there is a causal relationship that can be addressed. What I think is that based on the data out there that uh, we should be trying to aim for patients with very early CKD when they just have that initial renal endothelial damage. We should try and look at patients who probably just have only microalbuminuria, uh, and then try and use uh, surrogate markers of stroke, surrogate markers of vascular brain injury, like several microbes, like we're doing in the Mr. Hemostat study. That will be probably the first way to try and see if there's any signal of efficacy or potentially any causal relationship that can be addressed. We just looked at um, outcomes in patients who are hospitalized with stroke. We know, number one, whether you have an ischemic stroke, a hemorrhagic stroke, or you're TPA treated for an ischemic stroke, that you have a worse outcome if you have CKD than if you don't. You're more, much more likely to die in the hospital. We know that that outcome seems to be worse by increasing severity of CKD. If you're in CKD stages four and five, much more likely to die in the hospital after a stroke, whether it's ischemic or hemorrhagic, as opposed to uh, if you don't have CKD. And then finally, if you are TPA treated for an ischemic stroke, there should be no reason to withhold, if, if you are considering TPA treatment for an ischemic stroke, there should be no reason to withhold TPA treatment on the basis of somebody having CKD because there doesn't seem to be a higher rate of symptomatic intracerebral hemorrhage or severe systemic hemorrhage if compared to those patients who do not have CKD. And with that, I will thank you all for your kind audience and uh, would love to entertain any questions you might have. So, uh, very nice talk, Bruce. Uh, and uh, it would, uh, I, I have two questions. One is, uh, have any of these studies tried to look at the duration of, uh, of kidney illness? In other words, rather than looking just at a point in time severity, how about seeing if there's a difference between people that have had two years of kidney difficulty, chronic kidney disease, versus people that have had 20 years? Uh, that's number one, if you can keep that in your mind. The other one is, um, this seems to me something that's never going to be easy to get at in patients. They're too complicated. How about an animal model? Surely you could replicate some of the features of uh, chronic kidney disturbance in an animal, uh, independent of everything else, and see whether that accelerates the, maybe not strokes necessarily, but uh, cerebral atherosclerosis. No, I agree. Too. <laughs> Very important questions, difficult to, to, to respond adequately to them. 
So the first one, I, I know for a fact that there are, they don't tend to look at duration of CKD. You're absolutely right. They look only at severity, and it's in one time point. Uh, and that's an issue, I think. Uh, there have been prospective studies, but they haven't necessarily looked at the duration. And it'd be interesting to see if perhaps duration, um, and, and duration, of course, is somewhat mitigated by how you're treated. So some people are, of course, um, uh, uh, the, the progression of their CKD is mitigated by different medications, while other people do not. So that will have to be teased up, but I'm unaware of any studies that have looked at that. An animal model would be great. I think that would be the perfect way of looking at this. Um, I don't know if at this point there's sufficient interest. Perhaps if I could uh, get a collaborator of some kind to look at that, but that would be something that I think would be very, very helpful. Because I think, as you said, I think the clinic, so to speak, is too, it's too messy. There are too many things going on for one to be able to discriminate properly the underlying pathophysiology. So I, I agree with you completely. So I just love talking. You got the whole audience here. So um, one of the things that you didn't mention, but uh, I remember C. Miller Fisher going over this many times, that there are only two organs in the body that have this unique kind of, uh, of arterial pathology. This. He liked, he liked to call it lipohyalinosis. Other people call it proliferative pan arteritis. Uh, but uh, do, what do you make of that? I mean, it makes me think that maybe uh, you know there's just something about these two vascular beds that is a unique susceptibility to a third uh, agent, uh, you know, something that's causal. That's what I think. If you ask me, that's what I think is going on. I think there's two. I think. The, the, the similarity of risk factors, I think the genetic predisposition, I think the similarities of pathology, as you alluded to with lipohyalinosis, I think there's some third factor that affects both at the same time. So I'm not as optimistic that by trying to address the kidney, you're going to prevent, I think it's one process affecting both. But I think there's enough, there are enough questions to suggest, especially with this dose-dependent response, that enough questions suggest that maybe there might be some room or some avenue to try and severe some potential causal pathway. But I think there's some third element. Definitely, there's too much similarity between both organs. Even more so than the heart. We've just done analysis of the South Carolina database. And the, when you track the disparities in, um, in racially in terms of outcomes between stroke and heart disease and stroke and kidneys, kidney disease, stroke and kidney disease are pretty much it's exactly the same. Stroke and heart disease is not the same. So it's, there's something going on. I think there's similarities there. There's a common element affecting both. Not sure what it is. <laughs> Can you right. address any of the messiness that you're talking about in the clinical thing and all the thousands and thousands of subjects you've got? If you, if you take out diabetes or you take out hypertension, does that alter the, the kidney? Factor risk. Right, so it, 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 it doesn't. It doesn't. So in many of the studies they adjust it, but of course, with every observational study, there's always confounding that you can't necessarily um, adjust for. I mean, one would hope that if one is doing a randomized trial, um, things would balance out. And if one tries to make sure that the background therapy is the same, because one of the big challenges with this is when you put somebody in an agent like aliscrim, which also has blood pressure effects, you really can't say if the benefit you're seeing is necessarily due to some SVZ's effects on the renal angiotensis system, or it's just because of the blood pressure lowering. And so it's hard to tease out, and that's where the point about um, uh, uh, some kind of bench work looking at this might be much, much cleaner, I think, to do. Kira. Studies have also shown that retinal and arterial disease is a good marker. So I was just wondering how CKD versus retinal arterial ah. disease measure up to each other as predictors. That's, that's, that's a great, I don't know the answer to that. I know that at the ISC a couple of years ago, the Rotterdam group did one study just looking at the relationship between um, all three. So they looked at, you know, of course, they've done a lot looking at vascular brain injury, looking at um, uh, uh, retinal artery disease, um, uh, leukoriosis, and kidney disease. But in terms of how they stack up, I'm not, and I'm not sure I saw it published on the paper yet, I could be mistaken, but they're the only group I know that looked at that in, in any way that I think was robust. There might be questions on the... Oh, right, okay. Not, not quite yet. So, Bruce, that was absolutely terrific. I want to thank you for coming quite a distance to visit us here. And uh, Kira, thank you for taking over her position as chair, future chair of the 
International Stroke Association. And I want to thank you for the same reason, but with a little different uh, something in mind. Now she can do two extra clinics. <laughs> <laughs> I can, I can talk right. <laughs> thank you.